Good morning and welcome. Everyone say good morning. Good morning. That's right. What a beautiful day we have. Even with the snow, it was, a, um, it was just kind of a cleansing morning. It was beautiful to see. This is my son, Gabe. He's going to help me out this morning, apparently. <laughs> welcome to all of you. Also, welcome to all of you watching from home. We're glad that you're with us today as well. Um, I'm just going to share real briefly. My name is Glenn. For those of you who don't know me, I'm your usual barista back at the coffee shop. But uh, part of our journey a couple years ago, coming out of COVID and looking for a church, my wife and I spoke and said, you know, more than anything else, we want to find a church that loves each other well and loves their community well. We're not going to set the bar too high. The bar was pretty high. It was hard to find. We found you guys, and we're, and we're grateful that this has been our home ever since. And so today, we get to welcome you the way that we've been welcomed um, so many times. So I'm glad that you're with us. Pastor Joel is traveling around on a boat somewhere in the Caribbean, so we pray that his week is relaxing and refreshing and rejuvenating, and that he comes back um, filled with stories and insights for us once again. And uh, I also just want to say that um, as we continue in worship today, um, let's position ourselves just to receive the best of what God has to give us. Whatever you're bringing with you today, whatever stressor of the week, whatever challenge, whatever heartache, um, let's just hold it gently in one hand while we hold open the other hand um, for what God wants to share with us this morning. I pray a blessing on all of you today, and we're going to now join in worship with our faith worship leader, Terry. We welcome Pastor Brian Doherty up here to do the children's moment and also thank you for doing the message today and filling in for Pastor Joel. Children, please come forward. Some of you might not find that as amusing as I did, but a wild Pikachu just came out of the grass. There, so. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, that, that was to you and you. Yeah. What's Umbreon doing up on the altar? Okay, we'll take it. So, got a question for y'all. You ready? Yeah. Ready! How does it make you feel when someone is mean to you? Angry! <laughs> fine. Fine? You feel fine? 
that's a good response to that, yeah. Tell a grown-up. You want to tell a grown-up? Uh-huh. Sad. Yeah, it makes you feel sad. Angry. So And angry. Tell them my words. Yeah, tell them your words. Mad. It makes you feel mad, yeah. When someone is mean to you, you want to respond, don't you? Mm -hmm. You feel really bad, it hurts your feelings, you want to tell a grown-up. Those are all really good answers. Even fine is a good answer. That means that you have enough strength that you know that no matter how mean someone is to you, it doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to ask another question. How does it make you feel when someone is nice to you? Super happy! Super happy? Good. Good. Yeah. Chicken. <laughs> Want to be their friend because they deserve it. And, des- and, and if I know them, I'll invite them to my birthday. Yeah. Be happy. Happy? Yeah. I would feel very good. Yeah, feel very good. It makes you feel happy. It makes you want to invite them to your birthday. Actually, that was the perfect answer because when someone's mean to you, do you want to invite them to your birthday? No. No. When someone's nice to you, do you want to invite them to your birthday? Yeah. Yeah. But what would happen if we invited the person who was mean to us to our birthday? Oh. <laughs> if they prank me, I would tell. If they prank you, you would tell? Yeah. They might um, make my birthday a little bad. They might make it a little bad? <laughs> I feel like if a person who's mean to me is in my birthday party, he might destroy it. They might destroy it. But didn't you just tell me that if someone's nice to you, that you feel happy? Didn't you just say that when someone's nice to you, that they make you feel good? So what would happen if the person who's mean to you were made to feel good? How do you think they would respond? That's how I made friends with Seren. Yeah. Your friend is Seren. I think they would say that they don't care. They would say that they don't care, but did it matter to you? When someone was nice to you? If it matters that someone was nice to you, don't you think that would change everything? No. No? Well, let's think about this then. According to scriptures, there is no one that is good. Not a single one. But do you know nice people? We know nice people because it is God working in them that makes them nice. So it doesn't matter how bad or mean or evil a person is. If a person is shown good, they're more than likely going to respond with good. Okay? Let us pray. Dear God, let us be nice. Even when people are mean and there are bad things happening around us, let the nice things around us show us how to be nice to others. Let our niceness transform the world to good. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor. Very well done. I had a conversation recently with a, a church leader who said to me, you know, doesn't it all, all boil down to kindness, you know, and being kind, but some people have problems with that, but uh, we, we continue to do our best with that. It is uh, a good day to worship the Lord, and every day is a good day to worship the Lord as we give God thanks, and as we go to the Lord in prayer, we do, again, lift up uh, uh, Pastor Joel and his family traveling, and um, a special prayer request uh, this morning uh, for John and Debbie's uh, nephew, Keith, in Georgia, as uh, Keith Rogers uh, continues um, in hospice care. So we pray for them and uh, everyone here in need and all those of you who are caregivers and those of you who are suffering in any way. Let us pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for your great and wonderful love for us, a love that is uh, transforming and transform our lives through the abundant care of your mercy. As we thank you for your moving in and through our lives, no matter what the turmoil, pain, no matter what the loss, no matter what the grief, God, you lift us up and you carry us. We pray healing for those who hurt right now, here and all over the world, for those who hurt mentally, for those who are hurting of body and spirit. God, give us again and again your amazing grace. As we pray the prayer of Jabez, never take your hand off of us. We ask that you would increase our territory as Harmony Springs Christian Church, as we continue to be light in a world in need of light and kindness, a world that awaits, Lord, our smiles, our heart, our care, our touch. Be with us and among us, Lord, as we seek your will and way in this Lenten season, we know that you are with us and with people of the world who are suffering in war times. We ask, Lord, even for the children and the five who died trying to receive food. In your mercy again and again, hear our prayer for that amazing grace that we sang moments ago. And even in the song when we've been there 10,000 years, we've only begun to sing God's praise. We know that you have called us to praise, for this is the day that you have made. Help us, God, in every way, no matter what our situation, to be glad and rejoice in it, for our hearts belong to you, and you are in our hearts. We thank you, God, again and again, in all and many ways, in all the requests that are before us right now for here, around the world, and those who suffer, and those who praise. We ask you, God, to be with us and help us, Lord, to give you thanks as we pray the word you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As we prepare for Pastor Daugherty's message this morning, and we've already heard a message already, so thank you for that. Uh, from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light 
so that their deeds may not be exposed, but those who do what is true come to light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Go back to this microphone so that I can move around a little bit uh, freely. A little bit more of my backstory. I never was a free roaming pastor. <laughs> Even though I moved around quite a bit, my traditional spot was right here behind the pulpit. <laughs> Almost like a safety net, something that kept me enclosed, something that kept me to a certain place so that when I stepped out from behind the pulpit, then I could just be me. That way it almost separated this guy who's in front of you talking like this, who you can't approach, and then you step out from behind the pulpit and you can approach that person. <laughs> almost like a split personality, I don't know. But our scripture today is one of the most recognizable scriptures, I think, in our current culture. I think we haven't seen a football game growing up or someone's eye black say, John 3.16. We all recognize that. Almost as if that's America's favorite verse. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now there's nothing wrong with this particular scripture. However, as I grow older, I recognize how much of an issue there is with the interpretation of this scripture. A lot of people like to leave this scripture stand alone on its own two legs and say, this is the definition of what it means to be a Christian.
simply that God came down, wiped away our sin, and all we have to do is believe in him. And that gets us into heaven. That's the key. But a lot of people miss out on the fact that the surrounding scriptures actually help to clarify what the message was actually saying. A lot of people miss John 3.17, which was my father's favorite verse, simply because it did clarify this. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In other words, it's not our belief that saves us for heaven. It's not our goodness or our mercy or our love. It's not our work that does the saving. The salvation comes through Christ alone. Now, for those of you that don't know, I grew up in the United Methodist Church. Therefore, I have a very Methodist understanding. I have a very Methodist understanding that God doesn't always need our permission to act within us. God doesn't need our permission to act within us in the world. We don't have to first say, okay, God, I'll go, before God will send us somewhere. Do something with us. Which creates a pickle between that whole line that says all we have to do is believe. That condition that we believe. Now, I've had friends of mine who came from different faith backgrounds challenge me on this, saying, no, see, it's right there. It's in the scriptures, the condition. It's, it's what it says. He, you must believe first. And then you read John 3.18, seems to confirm this suspicion. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. See, right there it says it. Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Well, okay, I guess I'm defeated. We have to believe first. We have to follow this certain path. We have to come to faith through this specific hole in a wall, this specific church, at this specific moment, at this specific time. And if that's true, how did we all get? Did we all walk the same path to get into our seats today? Did we all walk the same walk to get here this morning? Did our weekly journeys bring us here along some specific path? Or is there more to this story? And this is the judgment. In other words, this is what it looks like. That the light has come into the world, 
And people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Go back earlier to that question that I was asking the children. This concept of light and darkness. This concept of good and evil. If evil is done to you, but yet you return good to that evil, what's more than likely going to happen? Is the person doing evil the evil? No. The evil is but an action. Humanity is capable of doing great good and great evil. Humanity is possible to do one or the other, or even somewhere in the middle. You see, where I think I confused the children this morning is when you think of something bad being done to you, you don't really put it on a grading scale, do you? That something bad could have been, hey, you have this hair out of place. Was that done in pure evil to ruin your day? Or was that to say, hey, you've got this thing going on, let me tell you. People have been in uninvited to birthday parties for far less. <laughs> but how does that change our response? As believers in Christ, in believers in this great love, in this great transformation, You see, growing up as a Methodist, once again, we didn't believe that you had to do anything for God to act in your life. It was known as prevenient grace. The work of God going before you to pave a way for you. You don't have to be a believer in Christ to do the will of God. We see that in our world all of the time. We can see God in the world through all people, no matter their ties to faith. But it is our belief that because of faith, we can see the good of God working in the world. It's because of our faith that we go from saying, you have to follow God this way, to saying, I see God working in this way even without following that path. I see God working in the world, no matter the condition. That is the concept of prevenient grace. That is the concept of following in our faith to be able to see that. Because the closer that we grow to the light, 
the more light we are going to see. The closer we grow to the darkness, the harder it is to see the light because the light cannot be where the darkness is. When I was just fresh out of college, I had no direction in life that I was truly going in. I graduated with a degree in religious studies, which almost shooed me into either being an archaeologist or a pastor. <laughs> My father had had his license taken away from him for reasons unknown to me at the time, which had me mad at the church. And while I still had my faith and my belief, there was no way I was going to put myself through that. And so I said, I got it. Youth ministry. Let's do that instead. I submitted my resume out to over a hundred different churches to receive zero replies. And then an opportunity came up in Charleston, West Virginia on the west side which if anyone knows the west side of Charleston, um, let me tell you, it's the not nice side. <laughs> it's the dangerous side. That's where all the shootings happen. That's where all the drugs are passed around. That's where all the bad happens. My parents asked me, are you sure that's where you want to go? My dad, however, I remember in my childhood, had preached this sermon one time, and let's just say the church was kind of stuck in their ways. They were stuffy. They made a point that everyone who came into the church had to be dressed to the nine had to be fully ready for church to be able to participate. You couldn't become a member unless you learned the dress code. You were ostracized for the community for any infraction. Even my dad, they weren't a fan of some of his suits. So they made him wear those black robe with gold lines down the front. My father was preaching at three churches at the time. This was the only church that required this dress code. Now it was a quick turnaround, a 9.30 sermon, a 10.30 sermon, an 11.30 sermon and about 15 minutes to drive between each church. Not let alone the conversations that you had to have. But between one of those sermons, you must have cut one a little bit short, because my father went home and changed. Now, he still put on the robe, but earlier in the week, he had hidden a beat-up cowboy hat under the pulpit. <laughs> my mother knew something was up as soon as she saw, as my mother was sitting in the choir loft right next to the pulpit, my father walk up and she could see the tips of his muddy cowboy boots underneath the hem. And as he gave his sermon, 
I don't remember it very well. I was six or seven years old at the time. I don't remember many of my father's sermons, to be completely honest, and yes, I was there every single Sunday. <laughs> but this one sticks out because this was the sermon where my father unzipped the robe, opened it up, laid it to the side, pulled out a pair of aviator sunglasses, put on his cowboy hat, walked out from behind the pulpit wearing a cut-off sleeve t-shirt, 1992 Duke back-to-back -back championship shirt with paint running down the middle of it, ripped up jeans, the <coughs> dirty cowboy boots, leaving mud clods all over the front of the church. And he said, would you invite me to church? Would you invite me to church? <clears throat> to which then I told my parents many years later, yes, that's exactly where I need to go. Once again, my application was denied, so I never got to be a youth <laughs> pastor. But that led me then in my ministry to continue to say, yes, wherever I am is where I need to be. Because it's not a place that defines what good can and cannot be done. It is the people that God has placed there that defines the good that can and cannot be done. Because you see, it is God who transforms all things to good. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, as someone who follows the scriptures and says, yes, I believe that Christ has covered my sins and therefore has redeemed me. I also believe that it is not my job to determine who gets to come in. It is God who determines what good is done in the world. It's not a determination by me. That person did bad things. So what? God can redeem that. That person does evil. Yes. But that person is capable of good as well. Fifty percent of the battle of our Christian faith is simply knowing that our enemies aren't our eternal enemies. Knowing that those who do harm don't always have to do harm. Knowing that Christ is in this world, in and through every heart, in and through every life, And it's not up to us to bring it out of them. God's already doing that part too. All that it requires of us is to be who God made us to be and expect that God is going to do the same in us.
because it's not us who does the work. It's not us who needs to make anyone else believe. All that work is done by God already. God sent his son. God sent his son to redeem the world and not condemn the world. Although, as I was preparing for this sermon, it seems that John Wesley himself thinks that, yeah, this is kind of a slight at Nicodemus, which is kind of a slight at the Jewish culture at the time, being condemned. But it's not meant to be a condemnation on any one people, but rather a chance at redemption for all people. And this, re this transformation doesn't happen through us but through God alone. It is God who does the work. God who makes things happen. But it is us who recognize the work of God in the world. And to make sure that we promote that Let us pray. God of all people, in all places, in all times, you meet us where we are. You meet us in this place, and that place, and all. God, you have shown us your glory and your grace. That through that grace we understand the grace that is offered to all. And comes through all. And is in all. Lord, we pray for your grace and love to be shown throughout the world so that when we notice it, we may join in the song. That we may grab on to the good. That we may spurn what is evil. And that we promote your kingdom as we share in the glory of your creation. We pray this all in your holy and precious name. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Jennifer, would you be willing to come up at this time? It's always hard following someone that can push like that, isn't it? <laughs> I have a joke that piggybacks that sermon, so at, during announcements I may share it. <laughs> <laughs> it may work, I think. Thank you, Jennifer. As we stand before you, we are acknowledging that we are all in need. And I can recall um, a professor in seminary who literally had us stand when he walked in and we were to quote a verse of scripture to him from the book of Romans and all we were to say was there is none no not one there is none no not one and that meant none righteous that we all need God we all need the Lord can you imagine every day for a semester standing up? He said, you people, you pastors, you're not righteous either. You need the Lord. 
and there is none, no, not one. But thanks be to God who gives God's great grace to every single one of us. I want to share a quick story about a minister and his wife who was let go from the church. And this was in, when I asked the minister what year was it, was that in the 50s or the 60s? He said, 1990. <laughs> I said, what? He said that he had a certain time he was to be in the church every, every morning. And a particular farmer in the church fell ill, uh, a cow farmer and a dairy farmer, and he said that he would go and milk his cows for him every morning. Well, when he was asked by the church leader why he was late every morning, he said, because farmer so-and-so, I'm milking his cows at 4 a.m. every morning to help him out since he is ill. And the elder said, that's no excuse. And they later let him go. Spirituality acts, doesn't it? Love acts, and love wins. And that's what we're called to, and that's what Jesus did exactly for us. He was acting on our behalf as he gave thanks for the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. This he said do in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he poured it out and passed it to them and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. For as often as you drink it, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I have a different background than Brian. As a retired industrial electrician, during my 40 years wiring, I can guesstimate I wired 300, 500 transformers. They are very simple components. A transformer takes the existing voltage and changes it to a voltage that you need and that you can use. You and I, yes, you, <laughs> can be like those transformers. We can take all the good and all the bad vibes that surround us and change them into vibes that we can use and that we need. We can radiate God's joy, God's love. Let's pray. Dear Creator God, as we partake of this sacred meal, let's reflect on Christ's sacrifice for you and me. May it nourish us and bless us to do your will today and every day. In your name we pray, amen. amen. He turned it off and I need it back on. Would you please come forward? And join us as we um, celebrate this meal. Everyone is welcome at this table. Um, God invites you. We do not. We merely give you a table to be invited to. Would you please come? Take and eat and remember the Lord is good. And a Savior, I see the healer of the nations.
see the stone roll away. I am in charge of the announcements this morning, and um, I, I face them with fear and trembling because I, I don't do announcements well. I'll tell you why. Years and years and years, years and years, it was probably the 80s, <laughs> uh, when I left out one person, 
that didn't get uh, mentioned in announcements, and she and her entire family walked out of the church and never came back. So when Pastor Joel said, would you do announcements? <laughs> and Brian, that's what this is used for. <laughs> so I'll do my best, but if I forget something, please, please have mercy upon me. We do continue our prayers and condolences to uh, Chris, Kristen, Christy and Aaron McNairn and the loss of their brother, Jonathan. And also, we continue again to lift up Keith Rogers for a healing presence with him, uh, Debbie and John's nephew, asked for that family. Uh, prayer on the property each Saturday at uh, 1030 AM. Also during Lent, Carol Cadwalder will be leading Bible study from 1115 until noon each Saturday. Also, if you would like to remember someone with our card ministry, uh, send the card, um, let uh, Tanya Blankenship know, and we thank her for this wonderful ministry. Also, we've started a meal train for Mads and Karen Colley. If you would like to help meals that are prepared and ready to cook or reheat or gift cards, please let us know if you can do that for them. St. Patrick's Day Bingo Bash, March 16th. Someone has rented a church. Does someone know more about this than I do to speak to it? It says here, focus on rescue and rehabilitation. I believe that's for horses uh, to raise money for them uh, that, that need rescued. Um, it says, get ready to shout bingo. bingo. <laughs> Thank you. I was praying that that would happen, actually, that someone would... <laughs> Again, next Sunday, March 16th from 4 to 9, our church is invited. And you can get tickets online, I would assume, also at the door. I'm not sure. Also, Girl Scout cookies will be sold next uh, next Sunday. I don't know how much how much are Girl Scout cookies now. Does anybody know? $6. What? Six. Six dollars? Okay. Bring, bring cash or they have credit cards as well. Bring cash or credit. Yeah. Well, they've, they've jumped cash, up. Cash is the church. Because if you use a credit card, it takes 3% of that price. Okay. So, yeah. I've already consumed two boxes. You already reserved two boxes? <laughs> Little Girl Scouts will pull out their phone and just swipe your card for you. <laughs> oh, and, and Donna said, don't forget, we need candy to fill 100 eggs. So please bring candy in the next couple of weeks and uh, for the Easter egg hunt. So bring candy for that. Anything I'm missing, please don't walk out. I have one on a, an unapproved message, and it's probably not on your list, so I won't walk out. Okay. But choir will rehearse after the service today. All right, choir after service. And Jen. I won't walk out either, but just to remind the Women of Harmony Spring this Tuesday. Women of Harmony this Tuesday? Okay. 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Yes, Max. Okay, more answers after testing, and Matt says thank you, Matt and Care, for, for the food train. Anyone else? My cheat sheet says we're supposed to set the clock back in hour this morning. Yeah. Just making sure everybody. Yeah, y'all y'all know we're <laughs> set the clock back. You guys made it. You made it. Oh, set it up. So glad. Yeah. Please wear green next Sunday, St. Patrick's Day, if you have it. Or orange. You can look that up if you want to wear orange. <laughs> look that up later, green or orange. Girl Scout cookies. Uh, anything else? I can remember my, my late husband said one time he was su uh, pulpit supplying, uh, filling in at a church, and it was the day of the time change. He didn't realize that it, the time had changed. He'd forgotten all about that. When he got to the church, there was someone up in the pulpit preaching. He walked in and said to the deacon, what's that guy doing? He said, well, he's preaching for you. You didn't show up. <laughs> he said, oh, okay. All right. Okay, 
do you guys want this joke or not? I don't know. <laughs> were, were you already remembering that? I didn't know if you'd remember. Well, okay. Brian, this one's for you. <laughs> I'm always in my head going, should you or should you? Should you? Did anyone of you ever do that? Should I? Should I? Should I? All right, so this guy walks into the church. Oh, we've all heard that one, right? <laughs> he walks into the church, and uh, he's wearing a cowboy hat and chaps, a vest, the whole nine yards. And uh, he walks in, he sits down, and after the service, uh, he thanks the minister and, and uh, nice service, uh, pastor. And uh, the pastor said, well, thank you, but, uh, you know, look at how you're dressed. He says, uh, this week I want you to pray about how you dressed for church today. And the cowboy said, well, okay. So he prayed all week, and Sunday he showed up in the cowboy hat, the vest, and the chaps, everything, and he saw the minister. The minister said, I thought I told you to pray about how you were dressed. And he said, yeah, well, I asked God, how should I dress for that church? And God said, I don't know, I've never been to that church.